Welcome, friends. The Catholic Church designates the 29th of June as the Solemnity of St. Peter and St. Paul. We will look at some famous paintings of these two apostles and at significant events in their lives. In Orthodox iconography, these two saints, when pictured together, are depicted in this two-manner seen here. In the main picture, both of them are holding on to a physical representation of a church because St. Peter and St. Paul are frequently referred to as the pillars of the Christian church. St. Peter on the left is holding, in this case, instead of keys, a scroll perhaps containing his epistles. St. Paul is holding a book, an affirmation of the many epistles he wrote in the New Testament. St. Peter can also be recognised by his white, short curly hair and beard. St. Paul is depicted with brown hair and tapered beard. He is balding with a high forehead that signifies great wisdom and learning. In the smaller icons on the left and the right, the two apostles are painted in close embrace. Tradition has it that the two apostles embraced before being led to their own martyrdom on the same day in AD 64 during the reign of Nero. But this is unlikely. So these icons are popular representations of the two apostles together. This relatively unknown painting by Giovanni Battista Crespi depicts clearly the symbols associated with these two apostles. I am sure many of you can already identify between Peter and Paul. The pair of keys held by Peter have been rendered large and very polished, making it clear it is he who had been given the mandate by Jesus to have authority over his church. The gold key represents the power to bind and loose in heaven, in other words, spiritual authority. The silver key represents the power to bind and loose on earth, temporal authority. There are two reasons why Paul is holding a sword. In his letter to the Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17, Paul encourages his readers to put on the whole armour of God. A sword would also be an essential component with armour. In verse 17, Paul writes, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The second reason for the sword, as we know, is because Paul was beheaded. So Peter has the keys while Paul wields the sword of the Spirit. Let's move on to significant episodes in the life of St. Peter and St. Paul, starting with this painting by Pietro Perugino. This painting is a famous fresco that can be seen at the north wall of the Sistine Chapel. It is an important painting for two reasons one for its religious meaning and the other for its artistic originality. The fresco depicts the dogma surrounding papal authority. The painting is based upon the words of Jesus recorded in Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 to 19 when he says to Simon Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. By showing the transfer of authority from Christ to the first Pope, Peter, in the presence of other apostles and other witnesses, the painting reinforces the legitimacy of the Petrine authority, from which all subsequent papal authority flows. The fact that this painting is located in the Sistine Chapel where popes are elected makes the religious objective of this painting more apparent. From an art point of view, this painting shows 
the Italian Renaissance ideals of figures, balance, harmony, and three-dimensional space. People are painted in particular poses and gestures. There is balance in the composition and harmony in the palette of colours. Most distinctive was the ability to transform a flat, two-dimensional surface into a believable appearance of a scene in three dimension. This painting demonstrates the concept of linear perspective. Christ and Peter are the figures of prime importance in this scene. And the key that embodies papal authority is painted along the vertical axis where the vanishing point is located. Thus, your eyes are drawn from the key backward to the building of the church, and thus the doctrine of apostolic succession is complete. The next painting is one of the famous paintings by Caravaggio. Caravaggio painted in such a way that was never seen amongst his contemporaries, and he is one of my favourite artists. Caravaggio's painting of Paul's conversion captures the moment when suddenly a light from heaven shines down on Saul, as he is called before his conversion. And in the artist's interpretation, Saul is thrown from his horse. Paul lies in a dramatic pose in the foreground, with his arms outstretched in shock. He is blinded by a celestial light. He hears a voice telling him that it is Jesus speaking to him. With his eyes closed, arms stiffened and illuminated by light from heaven, the scene conjures up for us, the viewer, that Paul is experiencing a moment of divine ecstasy. Curiously, neither the groom nor horse notice Paul's momentous episode. The uptum hoof is in mid-air as if about to strike, while the groom concentrates on holding the reins to prevent the horse from trampling Paul. This brings about a sense of tension to the scene. In fact, the horse occupies most of the composition, and this adds to the drama where danger is imminent, but Paul in ecstasy is oblivious to this. This is classic Caravaggio. The scene is stripped of all distractions. Only a horse, a groom, and the fallen Paul are present. And Caravaggio creates a darkened background in order to focus on Paul's conversion. The somewhat matter-of-fact narrative in the Bible of Paul's conversion is wonderfully brought to life by Caravaggio. Let us move on to a time when Peter and Paul met at Antioch. This painting by El Greco is painted in his distinctive style, and the artist shows attention to psychological characterization. Paul is painted with an intense look in his eyes, with a proudly held head. His left hand presses firmly on the pages of the written word. Together with the colour of the dark red cloak, he emits a characterization of conviction clear in his opinions and beliefs. Peter, on the other hand, is passive and gentle. His tilted head with sad, incomprehending gaze, a somewhat weak gesture of his hand, the key held in such a way that the prongs are not clearly seen, and even the muted colours of his cloak, altogether gives off a pose in contrast with that of Paul. I am personally puzzled by how El Greco has painted Peter. He looks gentle, but also tired, and he now has to attend to the conflict he encounters with Paul. 
Finally, consider the right hands of both men. They are crossed against each other, not touching, perhaps to accentuate that each has a point to make. However, at the same time, their hands are not clenched tight, but somewhat open to reconciliation. What is this conflict of opinion that these two men are encountering? We shall talk about it in the next picture. What happened at the church at Antioch that caused the conflict between Peter and Paul? Recorded in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, we read that Paul opposed Peter to his face. At Antioch, Peter shared meals with the Gentile Christians, and these converts would have taken Peter's presence at table as an official stamp of approval of the union and equality of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. However, when a party of Jewish Christians arrived at Antioch, Paul writes that Peter began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Paul rebukes Peter and accuses Peter of hypocrisy. In this painting by Giuseppe de Ribera, as the title, the dispute at Antioch indicates, Peter and Paul are clearly depicted in a tense moment. The frown on Paul's upthrust face and his gesticulating fingers show his displeasure at the actions of Peter. While we cannot see Peter's reaction, Ribera depicts Peter's equally strong reaction by the grip on the keys which denotes his authority over the church and which is held up almost into the face of Paul. The tension about the dietary conditions for and about the circumcision of the Gentile Christians are ultimately resolved as recorded elsewhere in Acts of the Apostles. Both the apostles were martyred in Rome sometime between AD 64 and AD 68. Caravaggio's depiction of the crucifixion of St. Peter is a powerful composition and one of his famous pieces. As usual, Caravaggio has stripped the composition of all unnecessary elements and like the conversion on the way to Damascus, he has created an almost completely dark background so that all our attention is on St. Peter. He uses a technique called chiaroscuro to make his figures more three-dimensional. Let's look at the composition. It is based on two sets of diagonals, one created by the wooden cross flowing downwards to the right, and second by the rope being hauled in an upward direction by the man in the light brown top. This gives the painting a mood of tension. Now let's look at the figures in the painting. The faces of the three men tasked with the crucifixion cannot be seen or is in shadow. This anonymity Caravaggio gives to the men makes their task of execution almost like another mundane task to be carried out. You can sense the effort put in in the pulling and pushing because Peter is painted as an elderly but still muscular man. The two men above the wooden beam strain with the effort of pulling while the one below puts all the strength of his back to push up the wood. The effort needed from them makes them lose sight of the fact that in just a short while, a man will be hanging upside down and will start to die. Peter's upside down position renders him more helpless at his crucifixion. But look at his face. 
He is not panic-stricken, but resolute. He accepts his martyrdom in this position because he does not wish to rival that of his Lord. Look at how he clenches his fist around the nail as if to hold on to the pain. The contrast between the executioners straining at their task with the calm and resolute Peter projects a notion that Peter knows that their effort is significant only because it will be the means through which he can witness Christ and go on to the better life. Finally, the way Caravaggio has set this scene without distractions of onlookers and with the figures set against a dark background makes the figures monumental, likely to reinforce the great significance of martyrdom. We see next the martyrdom of St. Paul. In Jacopo Tintoretto's interpretation, he shows the present moment and the immediate future to come. This is the last moment in Paul's life as the executioner swings the sword at him. Paul's body is emaciated, likely from his time of imprisonment. Tintoretto places Paul looking away from us because Paul is looking towards his heavenly reward to come that will happen almost immediately upon his death, as depicted in this painting. The angel from God descends to the scene of execution, holding two symbols. In the right hand, the laurel wreath, a Greco-Roman symbol of victory. In its other hand is the palm of martyrdom. Early Christians borrowed this symbol from Roman meanings. The palm branch was a sign attributed to the goddess of victory. Thus, Paul would be bestowed with two symbols of victory, but significantly, one of them a victory through martyrdom. As a point of interest, palm branches engraved on tombs identified resting places of martyrs. Or if held by figures in sculpture or in pictures, I identified these as martyred saints. The armour at the feet of the executioner could be those belonging to him as a Roman soldier, or perhaps of more importance as a reference to Paul encouraging followers to put on the whole armour of God. This solemnity gives us a chance to reflect on what these two men, often referred to as the pillars of the Christian Church, can mean to us. St. Peter, a fisherman, uneducated, gruff and impetuous. St. Paul, a tent maker by trade, but also a Pharisee, scholarly and articulate. By all accounts, these two men did not know each other well at all. And when they met at Antioch, their dispute could have caused deep fission in a young church. But it is their differences in personality that teaches us what it is to be followers of Christ. Although Peter and Paul disagreed about the Christian mission, their common commitment to Christ and the proclamation of his gospel prove stronger than their differences. For our reflection, our churches are inhabited by people of a wide diversity in so many aspects, and this naturally leads to tension and conflicts. But because of our diversity, we each have gifts to bring to the church. St. Peter and St. Paul thus serve as examples of how our love for Christ must keep us united to proclaim Christ, and also that their lives showed us that the Christian faith sometimes calls us to a life of endurance and perseverance.
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.